Well, it's time for 3ABN Sabbath School panel again, and we are so excited. Our quarterly is the promise, God's everlasting covenant. And we're on lesson 10, the new covenant. We hope that you have your Bible and a quarterly. If you don't, you can go to absg.adventist.org and download a quarterly and get your pen and take some notes. We've got lots of good Bible information today. What a joy it is to open God's Word and dig deep for understanding. There's so many treasures in this Word, and we are glad that you are joining us today for Sabbath School Panel. Let me introduce the 3ABN family that's sitting around the table, Jill Morricone. Thank you, Shelley. Privileged to be here. And Pastor John Loma King. Praise the Lord. It's good to be here, as always. Amen. John Dinsey. It's a privilege to be here, and I praise the Lord for the opportunity. Amen. And Pastor Ryan Day. Mm, always a blessing to be here, a part of this panel. We're blessed by each one of your presence. Jill, could you open with prayer, sure. please? Holy Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus, grateful for the gifts of your word and spirit. Would you come and teach us just now in Jesus' name? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. We have finally gotten to the new covenant, our... Um, memory verse today is Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the Lord says, behold, the days are coming. I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. So let's do a quick review. We've been studying the everlasting covenant, which by the way, is the foundation of the three angels' messages. So this is very pertinent to today's time and to understand what is the everlasting covenant. Revelation 13, 8 says, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Grace, Paul told Timothy, was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. And Hebrews 13, 20 says that Christ's blood is the blood of the everlasting covenant. So from Genesis to Revelation, what we're seeing is a progressive unfolding of God's everlasting covenant in the Messiah, Jesus Christ, God, who would become a person, the person of Jesus Christ. Each one of God's covenants builds on, it's, it's a greater revelation than he showed us before. And ever since Genesis 15, right after the, or 3.15, right after the fall, God has promised a holy seed, the seed of a woman who would bruise the head of the serpent. And that's what we're seeing. I just want to make this one point. Salvation's always been by grace. Hebrews 11 says that Noah, became the heir of righteousness by faith. Genesis 15, 6 says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. We saw last week that the covenant of Sinai, the old covenant, is actually a continuation of the Abrahamic covenant mm -hmm. because when God heard the cries of the Hebrew children, he remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he put it into motion. Here's what I wanted to just be sure I say to you. The Abrahamic covenant is frequently referred to as the everlasting covenant, and it contains devotion to God's moral law and salvation by faith in God. So we're going to just skip over the rest of this, but I do want to remind you of one thing. God's covenants are always God's will 
God's testament. It is an absolute error to refer to God's covenants as a contract. God is the one who makes all the promises and invites us to come into relationship with him. And as we enter covenant, the covenant does have conditions. God wants a relationship of loyal love. He wants us to walk in obedience to him. So it's the covenant of kind of like a father and child relationship or a husband and bride relationship. Let's look at Sunday. My time is going away. Behold, the days are coming. The nation of Israel dismally failed to keep God's covenant. They disobeyed. They broke the old covenant. So God promises a new covenant. Let's look at that word new. New isn't, uh, the better word would be renewed. It means renewed, like a new moon. It's not a brand new solar body up there. A new moon is a new phase of the moon. It is the renewed uh, illumination of the moon. So when we say new covenant, don't think that God, some people seem to think that God just said, oh, all of that failed at Sinai, wash my hands of it, we're starting over. No, it is the continuation. And actually, I don't have this, but if we look at Luke chapter one, let me, this, this just reminds me, let's see if I can find my scripture here. Luke chapter one, and if you go down when it, it's looking at the promise, uh, we're going to look at verse 69. It, Zechariah is talking about it and he says, he has raised up a horn of salvation for us. This is Jesus Christ. And then look at verse 72. Why is he raising him up? To perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham. So, and then he goes on, he says, to grant us that we being delivered from the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. This is the new renewed covenant following the Abrahamic covenant. So let's look at Jeremiah 31, 31, and we're going to take it apart. 31 through 34, Jeremiah 31. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I'll make a new covenant with the house of of Israel and with the house of God. Who's making the covenant? It's God who instigates the covenant. Not according to the covenant that I made with their father in that day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, which they broke, though I was a husband to them. Do you see that's a relational part of the covenant? God's inviting us into a covenant relationship. But any relationship, we talked about this, I think last week, any relationship has to have boundaries. It's, and so God is setting boundaries of love around his covenant. He says, verse 33, this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. He's talking about the new covenant. I will put my laws where? In their minds and write it on their hearts. And then God always puts this in, and I love it. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. God is a relational God. And then he says, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Oh, what, what law? He says, I'm going to write the law on, on their minds and in their hearts. We're going to come back to that to see what law he's talking about. No more, he says, shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me in a relational aspect. From the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. The word to know in the Hebrew mind was a relational knowledge. So God is offering forgiveness 
of sins to those who are in a meaningful relationship with him. So what law is he talking about? The word law in Hebrew means instruction. And the Ten Commandment law, God's law is eternal. We've been studying that. It is God's instruction of covenant love, how we should love him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love one another as we love ourselves. If just to go to a quick comparison, we looked, I think last week or the week before, the old covenant found in Exodus 20, 22 through Exodus 23 and verse 22 had the moral law at the heart of it. It had a civil law that was the, in, say, the constitution for the nation of Israel. And it was based on the moral law to teach a people who had lived in a pagan society for so long how they should act. And then it had a ceremonial law. Well, guess what? 30, what we find out is that what the, is what the new covenant is all about as well. We find the moral law is the heart of the new covenant. Hebrews 8.10, God says in the New Testament, this is my new covenant. I'm going to write my laws, the moral law, in your minds and in your hearts. There's civil laws. Where were the civil laws given? The old covenant, Mount Sinai. The new covenant, the Mount of Beatitudes. And they are a, an extension or a government around those laws. But God in the person of Jesus Christ came down to establish this new covenant and he fulfilled the ceremonial laws. I'm, I'm actually going to go off whatever I planned. Let's go to Colossians 2.14. I want to show you something. In Colossians 2.14, he's talking about that when Christ was crucified, he, he wiped out the handwriting of requirements against us, which was contrary to us, and has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. What was contrary to us? Ephesians 2.15 says it was this wall of separation it is in Deuteronomy 30, 20, 31, 26. We saw that the old covenant had curses in it that it was on the outside of the ark and it was there as a witness against them. We know it wasn't the Ten Commandments. And in context, look here, he says, having disarmed, this is Ephesians 2.15, or Colossians 3.15. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them. So let, uh, triumphing over them, let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbath. This is the annual festival Sabbath, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is Christ. Jesus Christ is the body that casts the shadow. Everything about the old covenant, the sanctuary system pointed to him. All, he, he is the ultimate sacrifice. All those annual Sabbaths pointed to his ministry and all the drink offerings and the food offerings, all of this was nailed to the cross because we now have a renewed covenant with the Messiah who has arrived. Amen. Thank you so much, Shelley. What a wonderful setup for the new covenant or the renewed covenant. I love that word for it. In Hebrew, the word is kadash and in Greek, kanos, but similar words, but they both mean new in quality, not in time where we get that renewed covenant from. I love that. Not a new covenant, but God is renewing it with his people. We're going to look at another covenant 
in the book of Hosea. It's not really a different covenant, but this is just a covenant. So turn with me to Hosea chapter two. This is actually 150 years probably before the new covenant is introduced in Jeremiah chapter 31. But we will notice some elements that are similar in this covenant that God makes with the people um, in Hosea as opposed to in Jeremiah. Now the prophet Hosea, this is he was the last prophet before the northern kingdom fell, and he made this strong appeal to the people. It was a time of spiritual bankruptcy for Israel. Now, the tribes had long since split, the ten tribes, the northern tribes, and then, of course, the two southern. So we're talking specifically about the northern, the ten northern tribes there of Israel. They had idol worship. They had set up worship for Baal and Ashtoreth. They had child sacrifice and gross sensuality associated with these pagan rites. There was injustice and oppression that was common. In fact, no commandment of God seemed to be kept by the people. God's covenant, it was clearly broken by the people. The theme of Hosea, this always gets me, is the theme of steadfast love. You see, if love is temporary and fickle, it doesn't hurt a whole lot because unreturned love or rejection is really no issue because weak love, it simply seeks another object. But if love is steadfast, rejection and unfaithfulness, it causes great anguish. Love goes on even when the object of that love no longer cares, but the person with the steadfast love, that love goes on. Tremendous suffering results. Israel's unfaithfulness to God caused unspeakable anguish because our God has steadfast love. He didn't just say, okay, I'm done with them. I'm going to find a new object of affection, someone else to love. It caused unspeakable anguish because they had turned their back on him. So we're in Hosea chapter 2. We're going to pick it up in verse 16. In the previous verses, we see that the nation of Israel had played the harlot. They did their own thing. They had children with other men. They chased after other lovers. Basically, they had forsaken God. They had broken the covenant and followed other gods with a little g, pagan gods. Then we see in Hosea 2.16, And it shall be in that day, says the Lord, that you will call me my husband and no longer call me my master. We see the steadfast covenant love of God. For I will take from her mouth the names of the Baals. He's saying, I'm going to remove from you that idol worship and they shall be remembered by their name no more. In that day, what? I will make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field, with the birds of the air, with the creeping things of the ground. Jump down to verse 19. I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness and justice and loving kindness and mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness and you shall know the Lord. I see three parallels between this covenant in Hosea 2 and the new covenant or the renewed covenant that Shelley talked about in Jeremiah 31. The first, the first parallel is that in both cases, the covenant is compared to a marriage relationship. We see in Jeremiah, God said, though I was a husband to them. We see in Hosea that you will call me my husband and no longer call me my master. The second parallel is that they would know the Lord. In Jeremiah, it says they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. In Hosea, it just says, you shall know the Lord. The third parallel is we see a certain renewing of the vows or the covenant. In Jeremiah, it says, I will make a new covenant or a renewed covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. In Hosea, it says, I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and judgment. There is that marriage relationship, that renewing of that covenant or those vows. So let's look in our remaining time at the heart work that God wants to do in your heart and in mine under this new covenant. And we're going to find out that this heart work, 
it went on even in the Old Covenant, which is what I love. I have seven promises that God gave to his covenant people. Promise number one, to grant repentance and cleansing from sin. Let's look at Ezekiel 18. We're going to spend some time in Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 30, partway through the verse. It says, repent and turn from all your transgressions so that iniquity will not be your ruin. Here's a call, heart work to repentance. Cast away from you all the transgressions which you have committed and get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. For why should you die, O house of Israel? We see this appeal to repentance, appeal to turn back, appeal for God to give them a new heart and a new spirit. And we know even repentance is a gift from God. Okay. Romans 2, 4 says, it is the goodness of God that leads us or draws us to repentance. The second promise is that God promises to write his word in our hearts. Shelley already referenced that in Jeremiah 31, but I'm going to show you a different reference. This is in Deuteronomy. This is going to show you that the old, what we call the old covenant was also written in the hearts of the people. We always say just the new covenant was. Hebrews 8, 10, of course, says that in Jeremiah 31. But Deuteronomy 6, 6 says, And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. Did you catch that? They will be in your heart. And in Deuteronomy 30, verse 6, it says, The Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, that you may live. So this is really under old covenant. And we say, oh, wait a minute. But the new covenant was when the, the law went in the heart. And yes, it did in a special way. But it also was in the heart under that old covenant as well. Okay. Third promise is to cleanse us from sin and idol worship. We're going back to Ezekiel, Ezekiel 36. We're going to end with these passages, Ezekiel 36, verse 25. The promise to cleanse you and I from sin and idol worship. Now, we might say, we're not worshiping idols today, and maybe not these pagan gods. We might not bow down to them, but we all have something, if you're honest with yourself, in the recesses of your heart that you might be holding on to above Jesus, or that you might be saying, I, I can't give this to you, God, because I kind of like it and I want to hold on to it. That's called an idol. It says in Ezekiel 36, 25, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean. He promises to cleanse us. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Oh, do you want to be cleansed? Do you want to be made whole? Do you want those idols in your life cast aside? God promises that he can do that. Promise number four, the next verse. He promises to give you a new heart and a new spirit. Verse 26, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. We don't conjure it up. We don't try to get a new heart. We don't try to grit our teeth and have a better spirit. God gives it to us. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. God takes that out. I love that. Next verse, this is promise number five. He promises to give us his spirit so that we can walk in obedience. Amen. Verse 27, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. You will keep my judgments and do them. That's obedience. He says, you will do it. Why? Because his spirit is within us. Because he's removed those idols from our life. Because he's taken out that stony heart and given us a heart of flesh, a heart that's open to him. Promise number six, he's going to be our God. Verse 28, then you shall dwell in the land that I gave your fathers. You shall be my people and I am going to be your God. The final promise, number seven, he promises to vindicate his name before the world. We're still in Ezekiel 36, but this is verse 23. Jump back a couple of verses. I will sanctify my great name. You see that? Which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst, and the nations shall know that I am the Lord. And how do the nations know that he is God? When I am hallowed in you, in their eyes. That means when God changes you, when God changes me, other people see that our God is a great God and he can do anything. Amen. Glory to God. Wonderful study. Thank you so much. And we want you to stay tuned because 
We're just getting started. It's going to get even better. We'll be back in 30 seconds. Ever wish you could watch a 3 ABN Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3ABNSabbathSchoolPanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. We've already had such a wonderful, beautiful beginning in this study. And thank you, Jill, for that was so touching. It touched my heart. Now we're going to continue with Pastor John Lomacain. Amen. Thank you so much. You know, the Old and New Covenant is a beautiful topic. I want to dive into it by looking at the scripture that is brought out by the author of this lesson. It's an amazing focal point where he starts in Isaiah chapter 56, verse 6 and 7. Let's look at that together, talking about the Old and the New Covenants. He says in Isaiah 56, verse 6 and 7, because a lot of times we think that the covenant is only for those who are just in the family of God, but the Lord starts saying, wait a minute, if I accused the earth and those in it of breaking my covenant, then my covenant is extended to the earth and those who are in it. Notice what he says. Also, the sons of the foreigner who join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord to be his servants. Everyone who keeps from defiling the Sabbath and holds fast my covenant, even them I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, or some translation says for all people. Notice what's happening here. The covenant made with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob to Israel, but the Lord opened that up and says, whoever, as, as Galatians says, if you are in Christ, you are Abraham's seed and heir according to the promise. So he's saying the covenant is not for any particular nationality. I just gave it to them like I gave mail to the people that work at the post office but their job is to get this gospel to the entire world. And that's why Jeremiah 31, 33 is so vitally important. He states the covenant that he made with the house of Israel is not just for the house of Israel. And we'll find out what that means in a moment. Jeremiah 31, 33. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write it on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. When we stand on the sea of glass, when the redeemed of the ages stand before God, the Bible says out of every nation, every kindred, every tongue, every people, God is saying, you've got a responsibility, those to whom I made this covenant, but go into the highways and hedges and compel all. What we're going to see now is when we read about that, now let's go to Galatians chapter 3. When we read about the expansive invitation from God's covenant to the world, let's see how the Apostle Paul qualifies this very carefully. Verse 26 to 29 of Galatians chapter 3. For you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. No argument there, but he doesn't stop. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus and... If you are Christ's, if you belong to him, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So the promise that the Lord made here, that not only applies through the Ten Commandments to all humanity, but the Sabbath, is all, but the Sabbath reiterates that. So when the Sabbath command was given, the Lord says, you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your manservant, nor your maidservant, nor your cattle, nor the stranger that is within your gates. When people come to my house or what stay with my wife and I, uh, we all keep the Sabbath together. They're not watching television while we're worshiping. The stranger that is within our gates, we let them know when they come to visit. Most people that come to visit us are members of our family and understand our faith already. But if somebody comes that's not there, we say, well, we honor the Sabbath from sunset Friday to sunset Sabbath. And the blessing that God extends to us 
blesses them also because that covenant is not something limited to nationality. But I want to bring something out as Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 13, once again, the expansive nature of the covenant. And then I'm going to make a twist on you that you don't see coming. Verse chapter 12, verse 13 and 14, look at how the wise man Solomon concludes. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. That's the King James Version. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. So when the Bible says in 1 Corinthians, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, this is all nationalities. The commandments of God, everyone must give an account. So the commandments of God are there for all humanity to live in harmony with or live in violation of. But now, the question is, we're talking about the new covenant. And the question is, why was a new covenant necessary? Let's go to Galatians 3.19. I'm going to try to move as quickly as Jill does. I've always said the clock slows down for Jill, but I don't know how. Galatians 3.19. And the question I pose here is very, very, very important. How can a temporary ceremonial law apply to a permanent priesthood? Think of this. Galatians 3.19. What purpose then does the law serve? It was added because of transgression till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. Notice the temporary nature of the law. The ceremonial law had a lifespan till the seed should come. In one of our prior lessons, we talked about the seed. Therefore, nothing about the ceremonial law was intended to be permanent. The only aspect of the ceremonial law that was intended to be per permanent in its symbolism was the lamb, the lamb, the sacrifice. Let's go on. Hebrews 9. Now put on your boots. We're getting into deep water here. Hebrews 9, verse 9 and 10. Look at this. Once again, talking about the temporary nature. It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who perform the service perfect in regard to the conscience. Verse 10, concerned only with foods and drinks, with various washings and fleshy ordinances imposed, there it is again, until the time of reformation or until the seed should come. So here's the question. Another question. How can an imperfect law apply to a perfect priesthood? Let's go to Hebrews 7, verse 18 and 19. For on the one hand, there is an annulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness. For the law made nothing perfect. But on the other hand, there is the bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. This is going to get really powerful. How do we get closer to Christ? Sorry, how do we get closer to God? I, I gave you the answer, but ignore it. Act like you didn't hear it. The ceremonial law was a shadow. It was ritualistic based on faulty animals and ceremonies that were inherently imperfect. None of those ceremonies in and of themselves had any perfection connected to it. But Hebrews 10 verse 1, let's go there now. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of those things, can never with those same sacrifices which they offered continually year by year make those who approach perfect, for then would they have not ceased to be offered? For the worshipers once purged would have had no more conscience of sin. But look at verse 3 and 4. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins how often every year why? For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Help me, Holy Ghost. So if the blood of bulls and goats and calves and lambs and doves can't take away sin, what kind of blood do we need? Let's go to Hebrews chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. For he of whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe. Now, I want to make a very important point as I read this. The Levitical tribe was never spoken of as a permanent fixture because the ceremonial law was not a permanent fixture. It was only to last until the seed should come. When the ceremonial law ended at the cross, when Jesus brought it to an end, he also brought the Levitical priesthood to an end. But how do we have a priest today? Jesus didn't come from the tribe of Levi. He came from the tribe of Judah. Go quickly with me now. Verse 13. For he of whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe from which no man has officiated at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which 
tribe, Moses spoke nothing concerning the priesthood. Now let's get down to the very fact. So out of what tribe did Jesus come? Hebrews 7, verse 1 to 3. For this, Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, this is the tribe that Jesus came out of. I'm going to make it very clear so I could run down to the very end of this. Jesus is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Mm -hmm. And when you read about Melchizedek, he's referred to as the king of righteousness. Mm -hmm. And in verse 3 of Hebrews 7, without beginning of days and without end of life, and he remains a priest continually or forever. The only way that we can have a permanent priesthood is we have to have one who liveth forever. And Jesus is he that ever liveth to make intercession for us. Amen. Amen. Well, moving to Wednesday's portion, the title is A Better Covenant. And this title is taken from the fact that in the book of Hebrews, it actually calls the new covenant a better covenant. Uh, but as you compare the old covenant and the new covenant, the bottom line is that salvation is by faith in a God who will forgive our sins. Not because of anything worthwhile in us, but only because of His grace. So, the question that is asked in the lesson is, where did the fault lie? What's the failure of the old covenant? Hebrews chapter 8, verse 7 and 8. For if the first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. So it was not a fault with the covenant, but a fault with them. Why? Hebrews chapter 4, verse 2 helps us with the answer to that question. For indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not be mixed with faith in those who heard it. So we see then that it is because they did not mix their experience with faith. So it has been asked before, we ask again, why then was the first covenant made? The answer is for the same reason that the law was presented at Sinai because of sin. So, I'm going to read to you that is directly from the lesson. The problem with the old covenant was not the covenant itself, but with the failure of the people to grasp it in faith. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 2. The superiority of the new covenant to the old lies in that Jesus, instead of being revealed only through the animal sacrifices, as in the old covenant, now appears in the reality of His death, and high priestly ministry. In other words, the salvation offered in the Old Covenant is the same offered in the New. Faith in the sacrifice that God provided. So, in what way is it better? It is better in that everything that has been taught through symbols and types in the Old Testament has found its fulfillment in Jesus. It all pointed to Jesus, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. I move, I'm moving now to Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1 and 2. Follow me along. The new covenant has a true tabernacle. Now it says in uh, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1 and 2. Now this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, right. which the Lord erected and not man. In other words, the sanctuary on earth was just a shadow, a copy of the true tabernacle, which, was, which is in heaven, of which Jesus Christ is the high priest. And you're going to hear more about that in a moment. I know you're just waiting for that moment. But let's go to Hebrews chapter 9, chapter 9, verses 8 through 14. I'm going to read it quickly because time is moving. Verse 8. The Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make who perform the service perfect in regard to the conscience. 
concerned only with foods and drinks, various washings and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of Reformation. You've heard this before. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle now made with hands that is not of this creation, not of this world, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with His own blood. He entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Praise God. Now notice verse 13. This has to be very clear. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And see, we want to underline and highlight that there has always been only one way to be saved, through Jesus Christ. I'm going to Acts chapter 4, verse 12, and we'll come back in a moment to Hebrews chapter 10. Acts chapter 4, verse 12, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. That is only through Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 10. This uh, has already been read. We're just going to uh, highlight that it was th those sacrifices that were offered, they had to be remembered uh, at, uh, once a year on the Day of Atonement. Let's go to Colossians chapter 2, verse 14 quickly uh, for the purpose of underlining something here. Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements or ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and He has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Those are the sacrificial uh, issues concerning the, uh, the Old Covenant. All those sacrifices no longer need to be, to be done because Jesus Christ, the true sacrifice, has died for us on the cross. He is the true sacrifice for us. He is the only one that it is only through the blood of Jesus that we can be saved. So this is why it's a better covenant, because it fulfills the requirement. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 7 through 12, it says, Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the, I will come. In the volume of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. Previously saying, Sacrifice and offerings, burnt offerings and offerings for sin, you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come, I come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second, the new covenant. By the will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. No more sacrifices need to be done. Jesus has fulfilled them. And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeated, repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. Anyone that offers sacrifices for their sins has no value whatsoever at all because the true sacrifice Jesus Christ has come. So if the Jews or anyone else builds altars, builds a, a temple to try to sacrifice, no value before God whatsoever because it is only through the blood of Jesus Christ. Verse 12, but this man, Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. So now, instead of symbols, as it says in the lesson, types and examples, we have Jesus himself. And so, I move now to Hebrews chapter 7, verse 22 to 25. A lot of scriptures. Write them all down. It's too late now, but I hope you can, I hope you can rewind the tape, as they say. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 22 to 25, By so much more Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. Also, there were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. But He, because He continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, He is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through Him, since He always lives to make intercession for them. So it is a better covenant because it has Jesus in it. 
the true Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And uh, I don't know if you're going to touch on this, but I'm going to read it really quick, and you can put some more meat on it. How about that? Okay. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly with confidence to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Praise be to God. And he is able to save to the uttermost. The worst of sinners. I don't care how many sins you have done. They can be forgiven through Jesus Christ. Come to him with sincerity of heart and you will be forgiven and accepted. Mm, man. So I'm looking down here at my lesson and pastor stepping all over my scriptures and Pastor John Denzi stepping all over my scripture. So it just kind of... It's great for to have repetition, but as I'm going through this, I'm realizing there's so many different angles to go with this. So I almost kind of deviated and, re and, and, and uh, wrote, rewrote my own message here to kind of fit the theme because there was other scriptures that I believe really, really fits this theme. But there's also going to be some texts we're going to repeat as well. Okay. Uh, this is obviously Thursday's lesson, the New Covenant Priest. So this is emphasizing what has already been heard. You've heard many times already that Christ is our high priest. There's no escaping that. And the lesson brings this out. It says the book of Hebrews places a heavy emphasis on Jesus as our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary. In fact, the clearest exposition of the new covenant found in the New Testament appears in the book of Hebrews with its emphasis on Christ as high priest. This is no coincidence. Christ's heavenly ministry is intrinsically, intricately, excuse me, uh, tied to promises of the new covenant. As you have heard, all of these, boy, you guys were like rapid fire through Hebrews. I think we just covered the entire book of Hebrews all in just like 20 minutes just then. It goes on to say the Old Testament sanctuary service was the means by which the old covenant truths were taught. It's centered around sacrifices and mediation. Animals were slain and their blood was mediated uh, by the priest. These, of course, were all symbols of the salvation found only in Jesus. There was no salvation found in them and in, in and of themselves. And as you heard very clearly, the Bible makes this very clear. Of course, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 4 makes it very, very clear. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. And there may be someone watching that says, wait, hold on. It's not possible. Then why in the world did the Lord choose to use animals, uh, you know, if it cannot take away the sin? Obviously, as it has been emphasized many times, these were symbols. In fact, I would like to go to Exodus 12 real quick. I want to just show this because many people say, well, why did the Lord, why in the Lord, why in the world would the Lord use animals as a symbol? And I think that there needs to be meaning tied to this. And, and of course, if you were in the situation where you had to take the life of an innocent animal that is symbolic for something, there was life. Lots of meaning tied to this. So Exodus chapter 12, of course, this particular uh, series of texts is in the context of the Passover. But I just want to read this really quickly. Exodus chapter 12, beginning with verse 3. The Lord says, Speak to all of the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb. Of course, we know that lamb to be representative of Jesus. And he goes on to say, According to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household be too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the persons, according to each man's need, you shall make a, a, your count for the lamb. And then verse 5 and 6 here says, Your lamb shall be without blemish. Who does that, who does that remind you of? Obviously, Jesus Christ, now our high priest, without blemish, he is perfect. His sacrifice was perfect. It says, a male of the first year, you may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now, notice verse 6 here. It says, now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. So they would go out and they would go out on the 10th day of the month. They would go and choose this perfect unblemished lamb, of course, all pointing to Christ. They would bring it into their home for about three and a half days because by the point they brought it in and they killed it at twilight, it would be about three and a half days 
pointing to the three and a half year ministry of Jesus Christ. But here's the thing, they would bring that into the home and you could imagine the family would get used to it, they would feed it, they would nurture it, the kids would play with it. When they would have to take that lamb out and they would have to slaughter that lamb, it's pointing us to the fact that Jesus Christ is our lamb and His sacrifice should mean something to us. It meant something to this family to have to take the life of this innocent lamb. And that's what this is all about. It's saying that not, not in that lamb in and of itself did that, did that animal take away the sin, but what it represents. Jesus Christ, our high priest, of course, was also our sacrifice. Of course, this is what Hebrews chapter 8 verses, uh, excuse me, chapter 10 verses 8 through 10 is bringing out as well. It says there in Hebrews 10 verses 8 through 10, previously saying, sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and offerings for sin, you did not desire nor had pleasure in them. Of course, they didn't have pleasure, right? We just read about it. It's, it's a horrible thing to even have to think about someone doing. But he says, you did not have pleasure in them. We are offered according to the law, or which were offered according to the law. Verse 9, then he said, behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first and that he may establish the second. By that we will have been, er, by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. So Jesus is that final sacrifice. He is now our high priest. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 26, and we're going to come back to Hebrews 9 in a moment, but it says here in Hebrews chapter 9 verse 26, again emphasizing this same point. He then would have to uh, would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Of course, all of this is pointing us kind of back. We're here in Hebrews, New Testament, and we're looking back all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. This is Jesus Christ, that same seed, that powerful seed, which the covenant spoke about, which the covenant is all about. And he offered himself to be that sacrifice for us. In fact, this also reminds me of the beautiful promise that we have or that was given to Israel in the prophecy of Daniel chapter 9. If you go back and study the, the, this prophecy of the 70 weeks there in Daniel chapter 9, he was told that 70 weeks are determined for your people and there's six things listed there. They were to anoint the most holy. They were to be ready to receive as a nation Jesus Christ as their Messiah. And notice what it says in Daniel chapter 9 verse 27. It says, then he shall confirm, that's Christ, he shall confirm a what? A covenant. Which covenant? Which covenant? The everlasting covenant. We're going back to Genesis 3.15. We're going back to Christ as that coming seed. And here it is. He shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of that week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And what breaks my heart is there is, you know, it's just the truth. There's many, many people in the world that do not accept. We have a whole nation of Orthodox Jews that don't accept Christ as the Messiah. And it's interesting because right now, if you go over to Israel, the number one law that governs that culture, that governs that religion, is known as the Talmudic law. And within the Talmudic law, there's something there that a lot of people are not aware of. I think I've brought this out before, but for the purpose of this lesson, I want to repeat it because I find it significant. Notice that the enemy is behind trying to eclipse and keep Christ as Messiah and high priest from his people. And so this is something that is known as the rabbinic curse. And notice what this says in the rabbinic curse within the Talmudic law. It says, May the bones of the hands and the bones of the fingers decay and decompose of him who turns the pages of the book of Daniel to found out, find out the time of Daniel 9, 24 to 27, and may his memory rot from off the face of the earth forever. You have an entire nation of, of Orthodox Jews, even still to this day, that will not study the, the scriptures, more specifically Daniel chapter 9, 24 to 27, why? Because it points to he who came to confirm the, the covenant and in the midst of that week, he brought an end to sacrifices and offerings pointing to himself as the Messiah, the coming high priest that is now transitioned into the heavenly sanctuary. This is powerful. In fact, 
Matthew chapter 27, verse 51. We've, we've read it many times. It says, And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up His Spirit. He died on the cross. And then it says in verse 51, Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And at that moment, the historian Josephus writes that the high priest Caiaphas came out of the temple at that time as he was about to bring the knife down on that lamb when really the true lamb of God had already given his life upon, the, upon Golgotha's hill and out come the high priest Caiaphas screaming to the top of his lungs, Ichabod, Ichabod, signaling that the glory of the Lord had left the temple because Christ was the ultimate fulfillment. In, in bringing that veil, the temple veil was torn from top to bottom, signifying that Jesus Christ is the completion of all of the sacrificial system, that now His ministry has changed. He's no longer that sacrifice anymore. He's completed the sacrifice. Now He is in the, the, the uh, heavenly sanctuary ministering on our behalf. I want to end with Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11 and 12. This is a powerful text that I believe really solidifies this. Hebrews 9, 11, and 12. But Christ being come on, uh, become an high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by His own blood, He entered once into the, and I'm reading the King James Version, which I believe is a more accurate translation here. He entered once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Praise the Lord that we have a high priest, Jesus Christ, who's still ministering for us today. He is the new covenant high priest, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 That's right. Whoo! <laughs> this has been such an encouraging mm -hmm. lesson. We, Amazing. You're enjoying Amen. it. I want to give each one of you just a <laughs> moment to make a comment about your day. Mine was heart work on Monday, and I just want to quote from Psalm 51:10. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. God wants to do heart work. He wants to create in us That's right. the image of the divine. Amen. That's right. And speaking of the blood of Jesus that He shed for our redemption, uh, the writer of Hebrews writes in Hebrews 9:15. And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Praise God for that. Amen. 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 Well, the Bible tells us that Jesus came and took our place so that we can have a place in heaven. And I want to encourage you to understand that Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25, He is able to save to the uttermost. The worst among us, Jesus is able to save. And if that's you, I say I'm the chief of sinners, but if you think you are, Jesus is waiting to forgive you. Mm, praise the Lord. Well, we're on Hebrews. Why not end on Hebrews, right? <laughs> Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, we also, since we are so surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Hallelujah. Um, this just came into my mind. Many of us are familiar with Isaiah 53, the suffering servant song, but there's actually four servant songs in Isaiah. That's right. And one of those is Isaiah chapter 42. This whole thing is a messianic servant is who it's talking about. And listen to this, verse six, chapter 42, verse six, I, the Lord have called you, capital Y, this is talking about Jesus, his servant. In righteousness, I will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the prison. Jesus is the new covenant. Join us next time as we continue.